Good morning. The title of this Dharma talk may be familiar to J.R.R. Tolkien fans. It was the title of the book that Bilbo Baggins wrote recalling his adventures traveling in Middle Earth with the dwarves. There were many trials and tribulations along the way, but Bilbo gained a new level of maturity, competence, and wisdom. I have been a dedicated one Buddhist practitioner for two and a half years now. In some ways, I am like Bilbo. There have been some doubts and questioning along the way. However, as a practitioner, I have gained a new sense of maturity, competence, and wisdom. The practice has taken a big leap forward this fall. I took the Canon One course offered by the Wan Institute of Graduate Studies. I would like to share with you this morning how taking this course has helped me immensely to further my practice. At the first Wednesday meditation session in July, Reverend Chiun Lee started the session by reminding us that we still have six months left in 2020. That was a good time to rededicate our, ourselves to our practice for the rest of the year. Her words resonated with me, and I did sincerely choose to find ways to be a dedicated one Buddhist practitioner. How I chose to dedicate myself to further my one Buddhist practice was take the Canon One course. Not to simply to take it, but to immerse myself in it. It is not about the grade, but rather the reading, listening, and reflecting on what transpired each week helped me to better cultivate my practice. I hope that the sharing a little part of what I learned during the course can help you in your practice. Wow, I keep learning so much each time I reread the scripture of the founding master. I read several chapters of the scripture book again due to being part of the course and discovered new meaning and understanding. I suspect as I continue my practice, I will continue to gain more meaning and understanding of the scripture and other books relative, related to Wan Buddhism. The course gave me a better understanding of the Ilwan Song and the Dharmakaya Buddha. In chapter 2, verse 14, the founding master explains it too. Hence, our aim is to worship the Ilwan Song, the Dharmakaya Buddha, so that we may worship not only the Buddha image, as the Buddha, but also the myriad of things in heaven and earth, as well as the Dharma of realm of empty space. In chapter 2, verse 2, the founding master explains why we worship the two. However, while the Buddha image manifests the physical form of Buddha, the Ilwan Song manifests the mind essence of Buddha. The physical form represents only his human form, but the mind essence is vast and infinite, combining being and non-being, and sustaining itself through the three periods of past, present, and future. In a Dharma talk given last year, Venerable Chuksan clearly explained in part the universality of Ilwan Song. I remember him stating that through Ilwan Song, we are connected throughout the universe. While we are sitting in our homes, we are also connected and also in the Republic of Korea or anywhere else in the world as well. In the first couple of weeks of the course, we focused on one Buddhism's doctrinal chart. The founding master's clear vision for the order is demonstrated in the doctrinal chart. The chart is simple in its design, but it's complicated in what it's requiring us to do. It's so much there. At the top of the chart, we have the Oan Song, a focal point for our study and practice. There are two sides to the chart. On the right side, the founding master outlines the method of study and practice for us. On the right side, we find the threefold practice and the eight articles. Taking the Canon One course helped me to better understand how to use the threefold practice. For some time, I felt that cultivating the spirit, inquiry into human affairs and universal principles, and choice in action should be separately studied and practiced. The course helped me to see another way to use the threefold practice in my faith and daily life. Second head Dharma master Chung Sun guides us on how we should actively use the threefold path. He states, there are two sides to the three great powers. One accumu accumulation and the other is application. One accumulates the three great powers when one is at rest and applies the three great powers 
to various situations when one acts. The three great powers that are accumulated at rest, if not applied in daily life, are powerless, like a plant grown in the shade. The three great powers applied in daily life, it's not based on those accumulated at rest, will be powerless, like a plant with weak roots. Hence, the two should be pursued together so that the substance and function can be integrated into motion and calmness and can be based on each other. To the right side of the tart also reminds us of timeless place and song. These two concepts are reinforced in the Elwan song. The cultivating of one's mind takes place at any time or any place. In an article entitled, The Dharma of Timeless Sun, there is a passage from it that is a good reminder on how to handle sensory conditions as they arise. Each time you are in contact with a sensory condition, do not forget to keep the thought in mind that an opportunity for practice has arrived. Always take in suitable measure of only whether or not you are affected by the sensory condition. The right side of the chart also contains the eight articles as well. We are called, however, to focus on the four aspirational articles. They are belief, zeal, questioning, and dedication. Two words that I associate with belief are faith and passion. Reverend Yu mentioned in a Dharma talk on faith that faith could also be defined as passion. From my perspective, to deepen one's faith, a certain level of passion is necessary to sustain the belief or faith of an individual on their journey. This is how this relates to me. Before I became a one Buddhist practitioner, I had been a practicing Protestant for most of my life. It was how I was raised by my parents and continued it into my adulthood. Yet I feel that my faith was lacking in some ways. At times, I felt the warm embrace of the Protestant practice was just out of my reach. Consequently, my practice and faith waxed and waned over time. Through my wife and the fact that I had started practice meditation, I came to the One Dharma Center to explore my spiritual journey. Once I routinely started to attend Dharma services here at the center, I found my passion and drive to continue as a Wan Buddhist practitioner was reinforced by my faith in Wan Buddhism, and that is the best journey for me at this time and will be for the rest of my life. The founding master helps explain this to me in chapter 10, verse 12. He states, You too should try to assess a degree of your faith deep in your heart. Although the person was still limited to other power belief, and not fully comprehended the fundamentals of truth, he's still able to lead such a life. And yet, if you practitioners who develop in tandem both self-powered and other-powered belief were to find yourselves obstructed by the vicissitudes of life, how can we call that right faith and authentic dedication? I believe the founding master has explained to me why I'm feeling connected to and become faithful to the Wan Buddhism rather than some other spiritual practice. I found in one Buddhism a way to cultivate my self-power and other-powered belief. Let's talk about zeal. Zeal is defined as a great, or in, great energy or enthusiasm in pursuit of a cause or an objective. Faith provides the passion to give us the energy or enthusiasm to pursue our path as practicing one Buddhist that we have to trust our faith to guide us to help avoid being overzealous. Chapter 3, verse 38 of the scripture, the founding master helps me to understand how zeal can foster our dedication. The founding master said, For practitioners, the moment of great danger occurs when various types of wisdom begin to open. This is because when persons of lesser spiritual capacity begin to acquire a little wisdom, they could lose their dedication to great practice and easily become satisfied with petty wisdom. This speaks to me in this way and demonstrates a connection between zeal and dedication. As one's wisdom grows in one Buddhism, their zeal, a passion to continue their study, reflection, and learning must grow as well. 
with a strong sense of right zeal, one will continually dedicate themselves to grow in their wisdom as a practitioner. Questioning is next. Faith gives us the passion to continue to ask questions and to sustain our faith when we may question it. The founding master helps us to understand why four articles are connected. In chapter 3, verse 43, he states, Therefore, the proper sequence is, first, after making a great vow, great belief arises. After great belief, great zeal. After great zeal, great questioning. After great questioning, great dedication. And only after great dedication will you be, will a great awakening occur. I'm not sure about the order in which the sta its states must be strictly adhered to. I can see where belief, zeal, and dedication help to keep someone motivated to ponder a great question or koan. Questioning in return can help sustain our faith, zeal, and dedication as a one Buddhist practitioner. A common Zen koan is, what is this? In a tricycle article, Martin Batchor, Batchor offers a way to apply this koan. Here is an excerpt from this article. If you meditate in this way, your mind will become more flexible, and you will start to see that actually you have more choices in your actions and behavior than you thought possible. The seeing will allow you to respond creatively to thoughts by knowing what you are thinking and realizing when you encounter a new thought. Normally, a thought emerges so fast that you are not even aware of its arising. You just think it and act impulsively or habitually. When you meditate, sitting quietly, trying to focus on a question, what is this? You start to notice what takes you away from the, your focus. Generally, it is a thought of one kind or another. The meditation is intended not to stop you from thinking, but to help you discover what and how to think. Let me now let us now talk about dedication. In thunderous silence, silence excuse me, Reverend Yu offers one passage that stood out for me. That is that is this. Initially, our practice is a struggle. We must fight against our tenacious habits. Yet as time passes, our practice becomes more natural and effortless. What this says to me is that we need to dedicate ourselves to monitor our habits and change those that are impeding our progress. I believe there is more to that, more than that to this as well. To progress in our practice, we must have faith that we continue to pro progress in our practice. More of the Dharma will become revealed to us. We need zeal as our motivating or sustaining force to help us stay on this path. We need a questioning mind to check our habits or be willing to seek help or for clarity on something that we have read or heard. Let's now move to the left side, left side of the doctrinal chart. The founding master reminds us that all sentient beings are Buddha. When you hear, hear the word Buddha, what positive qualities or thoughts do you have when you hear this word? Since all sentient beings are Buddha, why not try to find those positive qualities in every interaction with a sentient being you have? Yes, it will be easier to do so in some instances than others, yet with practice, we will see the positive qualities in each Buddha we encounter. In conclusion, Bilba had a long and challenging journey when he went off with the dwarfs. We too are on a long journey. Unlike Bilbo, though, the wisdom and foresight of the founding master Sotasan has given us the tools and inspiration to continue this journey and strive towards enlightenment. Oh.